All right, good evening and welcome. I'm sure people will be trickling in as we continue to talk, but welcome. I am Bill Brown. I am the director of New Faith Expressions for the Baltimore Washington Conference. We're celebrating all month because it was a year ago this month, actually a year ago last week that we launched Training Tuesdays as an innovative way to deliver content to our church leaders, not realizing that this would become the prominent way of delivering content during a pandemic. And this evening, we will be doing simplified accountable structures or the one board model. And I thought if we could have anyone to lead us through this, why not get the person who literally wrote the book on simplified accountable structures? So we are joined tonight by Kay Katan, who is a credentialed coach and consultant. She specializes in church revitalization and new church communities. She has authored more than a dozen books on church leadership and transformation. I, actually, she doesn't know this, but I first met Kay through a book when I read 10 Prescriptions for a Healthy Church. That's how I was first introduced to Kay. Um, she's worked with churches and pastors and conferences and districts and judicatory leaders across the country. She is married to Bob and together they have an adult son, Cameron, and we are just blessed to have her join us this evening. My partner in crime, Reverend Dr. Rodney Smothers. You may see his name on the screen. He will be joining us uh, this evening. But as many of you know, he's got a day job now as the pastor of a local church. So he's doing both during this pandemic season. So to begin with, let's start with a word of prayer, then we'll give some instructions and get started. So if you would pray with me, please. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us and mold us, fill us and use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. We give you thanks, Holy God, for gathering us together tonight from a variety of corners of our annual conference and all the way from Kansas City. We are just so blessed to have Kay with us tonight. And we pray for your spirit to be upon her as she leads and guides and instructs us so that we can truly be the church you have called and created us to be. We ask for your insight, your wisdom, and your understanding as we're gathered tonight, that you would open our eyes and our ears, our minds and our hearts to new understanding and new possibilities and new ways of being the church. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as you know, my friends who are joining us tonight, if you have a question, you can click on the Q&A uh, button on your screen and ask the questions, and we will uh, share those with our presenter as we go out throughout this evening. But without further ado, let me turn it over to you, Kay. The rest of the evening is yours. All right. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Bill, and thank you for the opportunity to um to share with uh, the great folks of the Baltimore Washington um, Conference. I'm just thrilled to be here. And this is one of my most favorite topics uh, to talk about. So um, I hope that this is something um, that is helpful for you if you're discerning um, whether this is the right model for your church or perhaps you're already using this model um, and you've just come for a little refresher course or uh, to take a deeper dive into the model. So. Whichever is the case for you, I just hope that you walk away with something that um, is helpful for you for your local church um, context. Uh, what I am presenting tonight comes from uh, the book uh, that I call Mission Possible, uh, that I co-authored with a friend and colleague of mine, um, Blake Bradford. And the actual title means we're offering you a roadmap for simplifying your structure for missional effectiveness, meaning how are we uh, going to align all that we do um, and our resources, um, our time, our energy towards the mission of making uh, disciples in its most effective ways. So if we were to take a full, uh, comprehensive, deep dive into simplified accountable structure, uh, we would be here for probably about five hours. We are not going to be here for five hours. So what you're going to hear tonight is a, a very quick overview of the model to give you enough uh, understanding and takeaways to know the model, maybe not know the intricacies or how to put it in place yet, 
but to understand enough about it to know whether it might be the right fit for your church or not. So uh, tonight we're going to be talking about different church structures, uh, and we're going to talk specifically about simplified accountable structure, and then uh, also talk about accountability using the simple model for, for that. So why would we even consider doing simplified accountable structure? Most churches that are thinking about simplifying their structure is they have this charge conference form that the district has asked them to fill out and they're just not able to fill all the spots. So there is a need for more leadership um, than they actually have. Um, and, and while that is a true need, um, the true potential uh, in simplified accountable structure is reclaiming our purpose, reclaiming why we exist as a church um, and concentrating more on that. Um, the felt need sometimes is we have to have less people in leadership um, and let's have fewer meetings, amen to that. Who wouldn't want to have fewer meetings? But what is truly possible is the transformational fruit that could be the outcome because we're having different conversations at our leadership um, team um, gatherings. When you're considering simplifying structure, you have the opportunity for not only technical changes, but also adaptive changes. Let me unpack that for just a minute. So technical changes would be things that we could figure out or we already kind of know how to do. So we would know how to have fewer meetings, right? It's a change, but gosh, we can figure out how to do that. An adaptive change is having um, these different conversations, talking more about um, generative uh, kind of ideas instead of perhaps maybe doing historical reporting at our meetings. That would be an adaptive change. That would mean we're not gonna report on all of the, uh, all of the ministries that have already occurred in the last month, but we're gonna talk about how are we doing towards um, making disciples in the last month? How has um, the ministries of our church over the last month moved us forward in our goals? How is it? help make disciples. So those kind of changes are actually adaptive changes. And sometimes doing those, we're not sure how to do or going to be much more um, difficult. And so this model offers the opportunity for us to do both, have changes in technical and adaptive natures. What I have found by working with Simplified Accountable Structure for more than a decade now um, in doing um, church con consulting work, in the typical church, most often structure is driving the mission rather than the mission driving the structure. I hear that again. Our typical church in the United Methodist Connection in the US has the structure driving the mission rather than the mission driving the structure. What do I mean by structure? There are four types of major kind of structure when we're referring to this for, um, in terms of simplified accountable structure. First of all, your calendar uh, could be part of your structure, is part of your structure, but it also could be driving. You know your calendar is driving your church if uh, it's about the end of the year, right? Thank goodness, 2020 is almost over. And if the calendar is driving your church, you are about ready to copy your 2020 calendar right on over to your 2021 calendar and put the same things on the calendar that we did in 2020, or maybe perhaps 2019 is a better example of that because it has been an unusual year. But we simply copy the calendar over year to year, do the same things over and over. For instance, you know, we do that chili supper the third Saturday of every January as a fundraiser. Um, so if that's uh, kind of the way we do planning at your church, then the calendar is driving your church. Another type of structure um, is your budget. And that would be the dollars and how we're spending our money is actually uh, driving the church. If the conversation always starts with or generally starts with, gosh, I don't know that we can afford that or that's not in the budget. If it always starts from a perspective of, of money, 
then perhaps uh, the budget um, or the finance team is driving your church. And the third type of structure is actually facilities. And so that would be any kind of real estate. So the actual building itself, parking lot, um, extra uh, real estate that you may own. You know that your facility is driving your church. If there's conversations of, oh, we couldn't do that, that would cause um, scratches on the wall or it would cause marks on the floor or um, we couldn't use it at our church in, in, in that way. It's against our building and usage policy. So if the conversations are always set towards what uh, the facility will allow or not allow or what would happen as a result to the facility um, as it relates to that event or ministry, then perhaps facilities um, as part of structure is driving your church. Another kind of structure that could be drive, driving your church is decision making. This is how your church is designed in its committee structure, if you will, um, for how it makes decisions. Typically in the United Methodist Church, our traditional structure has been four administrative teams, finance, staff parish relations, trustees, and our council or, or board. So we have the three kind of auxiliary teams, finance, SPR, and trustees, that meet and make decisions based on their area of responsibility. And then those are referred then to the council or that's the way it was meant to be for final decision. Again, in my experience, most often the church council or board is um, kind of a rubber stamp, rubber stamp kind of committee. Most of the decisions have been made prior to getting there. And then we struggle with having really um, spirited conversation that are missionally focused when we're making those decisions at the council and board um, level anyway, because we spend most of our time uh, reviewing reports and um, hearing um, about ministries that have been going on in the um, in the actual last month, or actually talking about the facility um, and what needs to be done to it and making decisions around such things as paint and carpet. Um, so that would be decision making. That would mean um, in a typical kind of church, you may, depending on the project or ministry that uh, you have in mind that you're wanting to get approved, you may have to go to um, the uh, finance committee first, which may send you to the trustees committee, which may, if there's personnel involved, send you to SPRC, you might get batted back and forth between two or, or more of those, and then you have to still then go to the council to get things approved. Um, in my local church, when I have uh, worked uh, in doing projects, um, I find most often I've lost all motivation to actually do the ministry by the time it is, is approved because I've been bounced back and forth between all of the uh, committees trying to get it approved, or they're giving me all the responsibility for a particular project, but they're really not giving me authority. They still wanna micromanage what I've been asked to do. So typically our, our structure is very complex. It's layered, it's hard to be nimble, it's hard to um, make quick decisions, um, and uh, it, it usually bogs us down in the life of the church. So when we talk about structure driving your church, it could be one or all or a combination of any of these um, types of structure, calendar, budget, facilities, and um, decision making. And most often um, a church is leading with their structure, being driven by their structure, and it's usually uh, two or more of these types of structure that are actually driving the church. Now, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the church life cycle. If not, um, this is referred to as the Bullard life cycle of a church. Um, the good news is that unlike um, us humans that only get one life cycle, churches can have multiple life cycles. And so um, it's important for us to know where we are in the life cycle of our church so that we're able to catch the church there at adulthood and maturity instead of allowing the church to get into this free for all when it goes down into decline of empty nesters, retirement, old age, and eventually death. Now, 
Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the life cycle segments have nothing to do with the people in the church and their age. This is the way that the organization is actually functioning um, internally as, as an organization. So for instance, um, you, you would start at, um, at birth and you find up there at adulthood where everything's really going great. Ideally, then you would launch a brand new life cycle at adulthood. Um, if you were to really be monitoring this, know that's what you, uh, where you are and that what is needed is to create a new life cycle. So you'll see under each of the life cycle segments that there are these letters underneath, V, R, P, and S. V is, is vision, R is relationships, P is programs, and S stands for structure. Um, let me just unpack each of those just for a moment, just to give you a little better idea here. And um, when you're thinking about um, vision, if our church has the mission of making disciples. Every one of your churches has the same mission, the same purpose, the, the same reason exists, and that is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Jesus told us, go and make disciples. He told us that's what we needed to do. Um, and so why isn't every church different? If we all have the same purpose, why do they all look different? And that's because the vision is unique to each church. The vision is the unique way that your church makes disciples. The vision can also be stated as God's preferred future for how you uniquely make disciples. It's looking down the road in a year or two, what do we want to look like? What should we be doing if we're being faithful to the, the uh, mission and the vision? Um, the next one is relationship. There are two key pieces to relationships the people that are already gathered and, and being in relationship with one another as we hold each other accountable for discipleship. And then the external relationships, those in our mission field, and by mission field, I mean those that are surrounding our church, those in our neighborhood, those in our community that don't yet have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's, here's what we usually have to do is to flip what we focus on, usually in the life of the church. More often than not, we are internally focused more so on the relationships of people already gathered, and we instead need to be more focused on the relationships with the folks that don't yet know Jesus Christ. So you'll see that relationship kind of changes in the different life cycles, uh, kind of depending on which of those uh, two focus that we're having. We can do both and, but we always need to make sure that those that are not yet a part of the life of, of the congregation have a priority. P stands for programs. You might also think of that as ministries. And these are the things that are going on in the life of the church. Think of them as your programs or events. What's mostly what's on the calendar are programs and ministries. These should be what are the things that we're doing so that we are living into the mission and the vision. Um, and so it isn't what programs and ministries the church down the road is doing um, or uh, what is the latest, greatest thing in Cokesbury. Instead, it needs to be, what are the things that we need to do so that the vision becomes um, a reality? And then the final is structure. And again, those are the calendar, budget, um, building, and how we make um, decisions are the pieces of structure. Now, what I want to call your attention to at this time is to be looking at the letters underneath the different life cycle segments. So for instance, you'll see that VRPNS are all uh, referred to at birth, but you'll notice that V is capitalized um, and the other are lowercase. When the letter is capitalized, that means it's a driving force. Think of it as the driver's seat in your car. The R, the P and the S are actually there, but they're kind of in the back seat. They're passengers in the car. So vision is driving the church. When you get up to adulthood, you'll see they're all capitalized, which means it's all of them are driving and it's kind of this, um, this, this great equilibrium. We've kind of figured it out. And this is where all of the pieces are working well together. 
And most often, this is where a church has hit the cruise control. Um, unconsciously, of course, hit the cruise control. It's where the church has said, oh my gosh, we've got this figured out. Don't change anything. It's working. And literally, we haven't changed anything sometimes for, for decades. But what happens is when we um, don't continue uh, to live into our, our vision, then we start into maturity and we begin to go into decline. So the very first thing that happens when you slip into the first level of decline in maturity is that we've lost vision. Vision is no longer giving us momentum and energy and excitement. Then you'll see an empty nest. What's left uh, or what's going away is our programs. It's like, oh, we don't have enough people to do that or we don't have enough resources to do that. And then you'll see in retirement, um, we have gotten away from vision. Also, relationships are now only internally focused, but we're going to try one other program because surely this magic program is going to save us. So what's common when you're growing, when you're on the left side of the life cycle, vision is driving. What's common on the decline side is that structure is driving us. So I love to um, suggest that churches uh, in their leadership team actually have a conversation about where are we in the life cycle and what is truly driving us. And once we determine what is truly driving us, what do we need to do about it? Are we in a good place or do we need to have some things that um, actually need to be changed, including maybe a visioning um, process or is the structure in the driver's seat and everything is in the back seat or are even some of the elements, uh, are they out of the car, if you will, and they're not even um, apparent anymore. So as we think about structure, um, there are some things that are changing among our generations and the way that we do church. Think about attendance. Boy, has attendance changed. Now, I'm a fourth generation United Methodist, and when my grandma Edwards went to church, then that meant when she was a regular attender, she was there every Sunday. Now, regular attendance is maybe once a month, and that's when we were on site. And now we're trying to figure out what attendance even means anymore in a virtual um, world. Um, we're finding that many people who are regular attenders in the life of the church pre-pandemic um, are not attending a church at all. Um, and some are attending multiple churches all over the country and sometimes the world and in just being able to capture different worship experiences um, from different kinds of churches. So our attendance patterns are changes. So if we lose someone like Grandma Edwards, um, it would take typically four to five people um, to replace that attendance so that we didn't see a decline in our average worship attendance. Although we're seeing that we really should probably be um, measuring the engagement of people rather than their um, attendance. Um, and that's proving more and more so in our pandemic world. The other thing is, um, I don't know about you, but um, especially early on when I would attend meetings at the church, uh, if that was supposed to get started at seven, typically it wasn't getting started till a quarter or 20 after because people were visiting and catching up with one another. Meetings were kind of part of the, the social part of going to church and being a part of the church family. Many of our, uh, especially younger generations, have... Um, kind of swooped into the meeting after maybe having worked or um, have uh, been with children all day, maybe even homeschooling children. Um, they've gotten dinner and uh, they, they want to come, roll up their sleeves, do what needs to be done and got, get out of there. They've already done their social um, aspects of their, of their life through social media throughout the day. That's not a need uh, for them. And People do not want their time wasted. It's no longer about being social. It's about how can I come and my time be invested well so that there's truly a difference that is made because I have attended um, this, this meeting. We're also seeing a shift from committees to teams. Um, a committee 
Uh, we say that it's a year or a three-year commitment, but too often in the United Methodist Church, committees have become a lifetime sentence uh, because nobody will take it or because sometimes people's bottoms get glued to a chair and they don't want to give it up. Um, committees uh, are come together for the sake of sometimes because we've always had a committee, so we need to have the standing committee. Um, sometimes our nomination teams um, would actually call someone to ask, ask them to serve on a committee. And when the person says, what do I need to do? It's like, oh, don't worry about it. They don't meet much, but I just need to put your name, you know, on this form. Moving to teams means you're coming together for a specific period, um, most often for a specific time. And when your function is completed, you disband you will have more people interested in serving on a team with a purpose and an end date um, than we will for standing committees and especially standing committees that um, don't have a, a purpose or um, and or have um, an impact. The problems with most of our structures is it really does promote disunity and enables um, dysfunction because there's no clear lines of authority um, there are clear lines of authority sometimes, not always, and there certainly are no clear lines of accountability. One of the other activities that I love to do is um, to ask um, current either councils or boards, whatever you call yours in your local context, to draw an organizational chart for their church. Um, and then uh, show their piece of paper of how they drew the organizational chart and compare it to the others on the team. Uh, most of the time, there are no two organizational charts that look the same. Some uh, kind of look at me cross-eyed like, well, I don't think we have an organizational chart. So if the leaders of the church don't know the flow of how decisions are made and, and the um, accountability, who holds who accountable, then your congregation certainly doesn't know or understand um, how the organizational chart would flow or uh, how the accountability works in the church. Most often all of the responsibility is on the pastor, but many times the pastor has um, little or no authority, or we see sometimes the opposite is true, that everything is dependent on the pastor and everything has to go through uh, the pastor uh, for approval or for action uh, or for a nod. And that's not healthy. Um, either of those aren't healthy models. So because of all of that, it's really difficult and mostly impossible to get timely um, decisions. So uh, this really showed its face when many churches had to make some really quick decisions when this pandemic hit about going to um, online um, worship that I hope eventually turned into online ministry. Um, and so often our decision making was so complex that it was difficult to make these timely um, decisions. Our inherited structure of administrative committees, those four of trustees, finance, SPR, and your council, um, are perfectly designed to make sure nothing new um, happens. And if you have the council, uh, the administrative council, and the council on ministries, it is even more difficult uh, to make sure that anything is happening. And that is indeed what happens is we just get mired down in this meetings and discussing, discussing um, and referring back and forth to different committees. And most of the time, nothing gets done. Most of our structures are very inwardly focused. It's keeping people already there happy, especially those that have any influence. So matriarchs, patriarchs, we got to keep them happy because they're the ones that are the big givers, or we got to keep so-and-so happy because if not, we're going to be in high conflict. And because of that, we are allowing our relationships with one another to trump the actual mission of the church, which means that we're not really in the game. And I use that term very loosely. We're not in the game of making disciples. We're not serving um, its purpose. Now, you'll see a little picture of a bike there. Um, I offer that to you as um, kind of thinking about uh, two different contact points for the life of a church uh, to create momentum 
and to an energy that you could actually move. Um, one of the points of contact are the handlebars. The other point of contact are the pedals. And too often we have everyone who wants to pedal um, and nobody wants to steer, if you will. Or we have everybody trying to steer and nobody's pedaling. And without both of those functions working together, we're not going to have any momentum or energy or movement towards the mission of making disciples. When we think about simplified accountable structure, we um, are very clear with the leadership team are the ones that provide the direction. They're the ones with their hands on the handlebars. Um, and then the ministries are the ones with their feet on the pedals, if you will, that are actually creating the, uh, the momentum as the leadership team is steering. And they, they go hand in glove with one another. But if everybody's pedaling and nobody's steering, we're going to end up in the ditch. But if everybody wants to steer and nobody's pedaling, then obviously we're not going to go anywhere. So I've mentioned a lot of issues with structure and our church and, and what I typically find, but I'm offering some hope at the same time. There is another way, and we call it simplified accountable structure. In our Book of Discipline 2016 version, paragraph 247.2, there is a provision that was written originally for small churches that allows you to restructure your church as long as you are um, able to meet all of the, the minimum requirements of the Book of Discipline, and it is approved by your district superintendent. Now, as I said, it was put in there for the um, small churches that were having trouble filling the four administrative teams, um, but let me just say that some of our largest churches were the first ones to adopt it because I saw the effectiveness and the efficiency in being able to, um, to do this kind of, of structure. So they're the ones that um, have originally um, gotten involved and, and really uh, kind of uh, cleared the paths in, in how to do this really, really well. Think about in your local church, how many people are involved in those four administrative teams. Usually the minimum is about 30. And typically uh, the highest number I've seen so far in a church is 76 people. So what if we were able to use nine people to do the governance work of the church and allow everyone else to be released in the most important part of the church, and that is to actually do the ministry. Uh, less people trying to handle, uh, keep their hands on the handlebars and steer, and more people to create that energy and excitement um, to pedal the bike in its ministry to reach um, new people. So what does it look like when we're talking about simplified accountable structure? Um, what it means is that there is one leadership board. So the SPRC, the trustees, the finance, and the council all come together into one combined team. Think of, of each of the nine people that would be serving in this capacity were to wear a hat with all four of those names or their placard on uh, their proverbial desk, if you will, would say they handle SPR, they handle trustees, they handle finance, and they're the overall counsel for, for the church. We find that um, many of these teams were having some of the same conversations in different teams. This brings us all into a holistic approach of looking at it through um, a holistic lens instead of kind of a siloed lens of finance or a siloed um, a lens of trustees or, or, or so on. Now, you'll notice that there's one other little uh, green circle here said the work teams as needed. Um, there will be times where other people will need to be pulled in to do um, some special projects and work that is set out by the leadership team um, from time to time, or it may be a sub team of, of this combined group uh, that does some work to be taken back to the group for um, further conversation um, and approval. 
One of the things um, to kind of think about um, is um, this allows so many more people to really be involved in the life of the church um, so that less people are sitting in business meetings and more people are able to do the ministries. How many times do we have churches that say, I just can't get anybody to serve or I just can't find anybody to do this or to that. It's because we have them all tied up in the business of the church, leaving no one to actually do the ministry of the church. So what does it look like? Again, uh, ideally, this is the purest model of simplified accountable structure. Um, there are nine people elected um, by uh, the uh, charge or what I prefer is church conference um, that is uh, put together by a nominations team. So the work of the nominations team would only be for two committees. Everything else would be a team and those teams then would be put together by staff and pastor to actually do the ministry. Nominations would not have to be involved in that um, any longer. So um, nominations nominates the board. They cannot be a self-nominating board. So nominations will do the work uh, for, uh, for putting forth the uh, nine names to move to the simplified structure um, and uh, then the, um, I like to say that the church conference would be um, the first time that it's approved. And then after that, by the actual charge conference. Now, these nine members uh, would all be serving in all four capacities. Uh, they would be serving as finance trustees and SPR. If you currently call your um your leadership team, uh, the uh, church council, then change the name to something else. If, or if it's called a board, change the name to something else. Moving to this model um, is helpful when you actually change the name so that people understand it's a new way of leading and it's a new type, type of leadership team with a new name. Um, also, we do not call it um, simplified, uh, or I'm sorry, single board or the one board model any longer. Here's what happened is um, we actually had a church that, uh, uh, that literally went to one team functioning in the church. Nominations went away and all ministry teams went away um, because they took single board to the nth degree of understanding and that church came very, very close to closing. They went from about 150 in worship attendance down to 40. Um, before we could get it stopped and turned around. So that's why we call it simplified structure. I also um, always refer to it as simplified and accountable because without accountability, simplified structure is, is not going to be a healthy model to move to. So it's a both and. The other thing, if any of you have worked in an older model, um, like I said, I've been working in uh, this particular structure for um, about 12 years now. And uh, we've learned a lot of things, uh, nuances, uh, and we continue to develop best practices. So some things have changed. So if, if you've had people that have been um, trained more than a couple of years ago, there are nuances that they would need to be retrained on uh, because now that we've been doing this a while longer, we've learned some, some better techniques and some better practices. We used to recommend representatives. So the nine of the nine people, there would be three representatives to SPR, three to finance and three to trustees. Um, we recommended that so that there would already be some work teams so that between meetings, um, if something came up around the building, you would have these three people of trustees that could address those kind of issues. But here's why we do not recommend that any longer. We do not recommend that any longer because what truly happened is those three little, um, th that sub team uh, thought that they had the authority and the responsibility like they did in the old model. And they were making decisions outside the larger uh, new leadership team and they didn't have the authority to do that. We had um, evaluations by pastors being done by that team that weren't being ran through the larger team. Um, we've had financial situations. So do not 
uh, use that model um, any longer uh, because we have found that it's gotten us into more trouble uh, than, than it was helping. Um, of the nine members, you'll need to make sure that one of them is your chair. Of those nine members, you'll want um, one to be lay member and lay leader. Um, and it, are, it is our recommendation that the chair and the lay leader are one and the same person. Um, if you have United Methodist men and women, uh, they can be considered one of the nine, but they would need to understand that this is not serving there to be a representative and to read a report from what's going on in their respective uh, chapter. It is uh, to be a member of this simplified um, structure and help lead the church in its mission of making disciples. We recommend highly to have um, a youth person, um, not the parent of a youth, but a younger person um, on the committee. Make sure that um, if they're not 18 years of age, they would not be able to um, vote on anything of a legal nature, anything contractually binding uh, if they're not yet um, 18. Uh, but that doesn't mean we should leave them out of the conversation. You just need to remember that that is one of uh, the pieces. Bill, do you have a question? I do have a question, man. You've picked up on my little cue. When you see my face, it's question <laughs> time. You may get to this, so I, I don't want to be too premature on this, but um, sure. uh, one of our participants, Rich, has asked how the staff interacts. He, the question specifically said, would church staff be automatically on the leadership board? The answer is no. Um, we recommend no staff. Um, you'll have your pastor and your nine people, um, and the pastor is ex officio, um, but staff should not be on the leadership um, team. When you think about accountability, um, the staff report to the pastor. Pastor is accountable and reports to the board. And so if you actually have a staff member who's on the board, you're then having your pastor report back to staff. And it's this kind of cycle um, that is not healthy and it kind of defeats the whole purpose of accountability. Great question. Thank you for your question, Rich. And thank you for answering. I will hide again. Okay, great, great. So when we think about the simplified accountable structure, um, there are three primary kind of responsibilities that you would want to um, focus most of the time. First of all, tending to the stewardship of those assets. Um, then the strategic piece is um, working to set the congregation's priorities. You're monitoring um, mission, you're uh, monitoring vision, you're setting goals, and then you're aligning all of the resources so that the mission, vision, and goals are being um, accomplished. Uh, and then you're also doing this generative thing. Um, and, and this is, you're actually looking for what's going on in our mission field. And as a church, how do we need to be shifting what's going on inside so that we still are missionally effective based on what's going on um, in, our, in our mission field? And this is where we really typically don't do a very good job of because we're doing so much of the management that we never get to this kind of work. And therefore, that's how we grow um, culturally irrelevant to our mission field is because we've been so internally focused on taking care of our inside business that we're not doing the strategic and generative work um, of, of the board. Guiding principles are um, a way for us to set really healthy boundaries for policies and procedures that allow us to be very permission giving. Um, the board is not to be managing, the board is to govern. And we haven't had anybody governing. And so uh, by putting uh, the leadership team in the governing role, what they need to do then is to write some guiding principles that will allow the day-to-day -day operations to function, to give permission within healthy boundaries. Um, and then this is what allows things to flow and for us to be able to make much better and much more timely um, decisions. These would be around spending policies um, and uh, it would be around building usage. I mean, you make macro decisions instead of bringing every decision to the board and we're making micro decisions over and over and over and over again. 
in Mission Possible, I go into this pretty um, deep and give you actually some, um, some examples of those guiding principles. I'm not gonna paint this as a rosy picture. Um, there are two challenges to simplified accountable structure. Um, you have to over communicate. Too many churches um, have used the council meeting to communicate. That is not the purpose of a council. So you're gonna have to develop the true communication channels of letting people know what's going on in the life of, of the church with multiple formats, town hall meetings, um, some of your leaders actually doing some articles in the newsletter, create two-way conversations, be very transparent, and you're going to have to build trust with the congregation. The congregation needs to understand that this is an accountable leadership, and it's going to feel sometimes like a power grab because nine people instead of 50 or whatever your number is are now leading the church um, in this governance model, and so there has to be trust build up um, around that and you do that with communication and transparency. Uh, you've got to make sure that you make decisions um, that are in alignment with the mission and vision that you truly do shift to accountable leadership. If your church isn't willing or able to um, work the accountable leadership model, then you're not ready to go into uh, this model yet. Um, Decision-making is in alignment with the mission, not in alignment with making people happy. And the meetings are very strategic and no longer reporting. I actually have provided you here with a recommended agenda for simplified accountable structure. You'll notice that this probably does not look like a typical agenda. Going from four meetings uh, that last anywhere from two hours plus um, for four different teams. Um, so there was eight to 10 hours of meetings a month. Um, in this model, believe me, it, it can be done. I've seen it done. I've helped churches get there. You may be able, you are able to do all that was done um, in those meetings or in other ways um, in a 90 minute format using this agenda. And 30 minutes of this agenda, the first three items are done and 30 minutes is spent on prayer, spiritual formation and leadership development. If our leaders are not doing spiritual and leadership development, then we are not modeling what we want or need for the other teams to be doing in our church. Um, most of this is done and driven by laity, the piece that the, that the pastor is responsible for is the review of, of the goals. Um, we have a packet that's sent out electronically where the reports are in it. We don't have to read the reports. We're not, do, we're not receiving ministry reports whatsoever, but those reports would be the minutes of the previous meeting and financial reports and so on. Um, and we only talk about those if they need to be approved like the minutes or if there's an issue that um, someone has or a question that needs to be uh, clarified. So we don't spend time there. Um, and then uh, the pressing issues and problem solving, that is where we're actually doing that strategic and generative work um, that we typically don't have time to do. Communication is what's been decided here. What's the messaging around that decision? Who is responsible for communicating and how is it going to be communicated um, so that everybody's on the same page and that it is in the minutes before we leave. And laity uh, are the ones that are providing the prayer, the spiritual formation and the leadership um, development. The pastor can take a turn, but that is not the pastor's uh, sole responsibility to provide all of those pieces. And again, in Mission Possible, there's details about how each of those pieces work. Annually, you want to make sure that the new leadership team is evaluating current ministry from a big picture standpoint, um, not every detail. Review the vision and the church life cycle. You're going to be setting your annual goals at a strategic planning retreat, and you set the budget after strategies are designed. Um, too often, we set the budget, and then we try to ask the um, the ministries to figure it out. Um, and uh, that's backwards. Actually, the strategies need to come and the alignment of the budget needs to come um, after that. So I, I love um, 
so, so this is what accountable leadership is about, is really holding accountable to the mission of making disciples, which is actually also um, the mission of the United Methodist Church. In the book, Winning on Purpose, highly recommend it for understanding the accountable leadership model. No, it is a Baptist book. So here, the theory of it, some of our polity is different. Um, you may not like the terminology CEO, put pastor in replacement of that, but it's too good of a book of, of a great explanation of what accountable leadership looks like um, that I don't want to throw it away just because of those couple of issues. Just know that going in. In the forward of that book, and the author, John Edmund Kaiser of Winning on Purpose is actually the one that wrote the foreword of, of Mission um, Possible. But in his foreword of, of Winning on Purpose, Tom Bandy, who um, is a, a, a highly respected church consultant, um, offers this. Are, do you really want the mission to succeed? Are you prepared to stake everything, change anything, and do whatever it takes even, even if it means altering long familiar habits, redeploying precious programs, and redeploying sacred assets. Friends, this is what accountable leadership looks like. Are we willing and prepared to stake everything, change anything, and do whatever it takes? Even if it's things that we are comfortable with or we love, are we willing and, and able to redeploy um, programs and assets so that the mission can succeed. Often our churches are ran with um, bureaucratic kind of means by large group driven, you know, consensus driven um, or autocratic by um, one person, whether that's a patriarch, a patriarch or a pastor um, or we're committee based or pastor-centered or personality-driven. And then what I'm offering to you tonight is uh, accountability-driven. Uh, when it's bureaucratic, the pastor is expected to accomplish the mission but doesn't have any power to do so. So they're given responsibility, don't have the authority. So it's pretty safe, but it's not very effective in being missionally focused. Autocratic, in that model, the pastor is expected to accomplish the mission and has the power to do so, but no consequences for not being missionally focused and producing fruit. So you have the responsibility, you have the authority, but no accountability. So it can be pretty effective, but it's not a safe way for the church to be driven. A committee-based or consensus-driven leadership, decisions are slow, that's if they happen at all. Um, decisions, since we're all trying to get to consensus, um, are not always focused on the mission. Um, consensus usually is um, a place that arrives where we're not doing our best work because we had to dial it back to make everybody happy. Um, consensus is often not achieved, instead compromises the rule. And we have decided it's better to maintain our relationships with one another than it is to fulfill the mission. Um, Committee-based means that there's no one person who can be held accountable. Um, you can't hold a team accountable, you hold people accountable. The role of the pastor and staff are very limited and the pastor and the staff are evaluated by the congregation. In a pastor-centered church, the pastor's making all the major decisions. Everything revolves around and is dependent upon the pastor and decisions are made, are made quickly, maybe even knee-jerk kind of things, impulsively and unrealistically. Dissent is not tolerated. And the pastor finds himself or herself putting out fires most of the time. The laity leaders are evaluated by the pastor and the staff. And oftentimes the congregation feels run over and disconnected from the ministry of the church. However, when we practice accountable leadership, it ties together responsibility plus authority plus accountability, which means it's safe and effective. So the duties and the obligations um, are tied to the power and direction and the willingness to accept that responsibility so that we have a safe and effective um, way to lead our church. Those responsible are held accountable in a missional focused um, accountable leadership model. The mission of the church comes first. It's the priority. It's what leads us, it, what directs us. Um, we have to have the right people in place to accomplish the mission. A small number of decision makers that allow us to have 
the greatest number of people in ministry. Shepherding is done by the laity, not the pastor. The pastor evaluates the staff. Um, everyone is held accountable for the mission and alignment to the mission and vision is critical. It is not about consensus. So in this slide I'm offering to you, this comes right out of Winning on Purpose. And if you were to think about um, accountable leadership like a, a football team, if you will, uh, the ministry is done by the teammates um, and outreach first, and then we care for one another. The staff is doing the equipping and coordinating. They have the management role. Think of them as the assistant coaches or the specialist. The pastor is in a leadership role. Think of the pastor as um, the head coach or the quarterback or the captain of the team. And they function uh, with, through vision, direction, and teaching. And the final piece in accountable leadership is the board is actually governing. Uh, think of them as the commissioner, the umpire, the scorekeeper, if you will. And their function is around accountability and um, support. Here are um, the responsibilities uh, or role of the pastor in the um, accountable uh, leadership model. You'll see that they are the keeper of the mission, caster of the vision in a congregational approach, example of evangelists, chief fundraiser, main recruiter. They develop leaders, including um, the staff and help with board and uh, new leaders since they are the chair of nominations and nominations is nominations and lay leadership development. So through this model, lay leadership development uh, is given to and expected of our nominations um, team. When we think about accountable leadership, it, it marries all the three pieces together. There, it promotes unity because we're all rowing in the same direction towards mission and vision. It has to function on a high level of trust. Decisions can be very made very quickly but they're made within healthy boundaries that are set by those guiding principles. Mission and vision is certainly the driving force and goals and objectives of ministry can be um, adjusted as needed. I offer to you this organizational chart as an example of what the accountable leadership um, in a simplified structure can look like. So in this particular piece, the leadership board is accountable to Christ, hear that, the leadership board is accountable to Christ for leading the church in its mission and vision. The leadership team is accountable to Christ. When we understand that, that can flip our whole way we do church. Nominations um, is an extension of the leadership board. And I would even put it maybe down sometimes with the pastor because the pastor is the chair by book of discipline of the nominations um, committee. But the... Um, the members of the board are actually voted in by a church or a charge conference. The pastor, the pastor is accountable to the board and then staff, paid and unpaid staff people. And by unpaid, I mean people who are leading ministries that may not be paid or, or think of as staff, but they truly are if they're leading. And this building maintenance team is actually the people who like to do um, the handiwork of the church, whether it's flower beds or painting or, you know, fixing uh, or replacing light bulbs or, you know, fixing switches or whatever. That's a building maintenance team. That is a ministry team. That is not the work of the trustees. It never was. Somehow we got to the point of practicing it that way. So that's actually done as a ministry team. And we're given permission through the guiding principles of their parameters that um, they can do that ministry without coming and asking for every penny uh, that needs to be spent. So that line of, uh, of staff uh, reports to the pastor, and then under each of those staff, they would have actual ministry teams, and the um, ministry teams uh, would be accountable to that staff member. Look at the mission is held up by the leadership board, mission accountable to Christ. The vision is held by the, the pastor and the leader. The goals of the church are done between the leadership board and the pastor, but the goal uh, the goals are accountable um, for the pastor. 
And then um, the management strategies actually happen at a much lower level. We don't spend time planning ministries in our council meetings anymore. Um, that's actually done in uh, staff meetings and staff uh, retreats. The ministry impact then is the greatest portion and the greatest number of, of people. So the focus changes when you move to simplified accountable structure. It's more than reducing the number of people that are in leadership. Um, it is about changing the work at the table and also the conversation at the table. For when we aim at nothing, that's exactly what we hit. But strategic ministry planning helps us aim. Um, and that is what is done at the uh, leadership team every fall to get those goals in place. One of the ways we think about accountable leadership is the simple model. You have to set expectations uh, for what you're asking the person to take responsibility and authority for. Invite their commitment in it. Measure progress. So that means you have to have some way to measure that progress and hold them accountable for making that progress. Provide feedback to those that you're holding accountable. Link to consequences and evaluate the effectiveness towards um, the intended outcome. So think about accountability as not a big old club that we're hitting people over the head with, but it's offering feedback and um, and helping them understand what they're doing in the life of the church, how it is a piece of the bigger picture of the life of the church and its mission and its vision. They're not doing it for the sake of doing it. They're doing it because this is an important part in us being missionally effective and living out our purpose of making disciples. So who should adopt simplified accountable uh, structure? All churches, I believe, would be much healthier if they were practicing accountable leadership. Indeed, some churches um, would be ready uh, to do simplified uh, structure with accountable uh, leadership. But no church should move to simplified structure without accountable leadership. It is just simply too dangerous to move into that model without accountable leadership. There are three phases to moving into this model. The first is the discernment phase. A church actually decides that they, they want to explore this phase and they hold um, informational meetings. They put a prayer team together um, to pray if this is the right season and the right model. Um, and they um, actually um, have some conversations, congregational conversations so that there's enough equipping, understanding information sharing about what this model is um, and then get some feedback if the, if the congregation is on board in moving to this model. This should not be a, a process that is driven by one person, whether it's a pastor or a lay person or two people. This has to be a congregational decision. Um, too often we have one person that is driving it. Um, and if it's the pastor, you get a reappointment and then you have no buy-in from the um, that from the congregation, especially if it if it was approved in a charge conference in a cluster charge conference that nobody attended and all of a sudden it changed and people don't understand how it changed or why it changed or what we're doing now. So there's a discernment phase that helps you walk through um, with a certified a simplified accountable structure uh, coach that will help walk through a several month process of discernment uh, phase. Um, once that decision is made, your DS is involved in the discernment um, and it's approved by the um, first the DS and then your congregation um, and then the work of the nomination starts. Then we move into the equipping, getting everyone resourced and equipped to move into um, this new model so that we are able to have a different conversation um, at the table and um, to move into this governance model and out of management. And then the third phase is that first year of living into this new model and developing the leadership covenant, developing the guiding principles and helping change the conversation, um, living into the new um, agenda because you are creating a new way of leading the church. 
And if you don't have someone walking alongside you, then um, you're typically going to bring the old habits and the old way of leading meetings and even content of the meetings into a new model. And that's when the accountability is not present and we're not doing the strategic work, uh, fiduciary work, generative work. We are back to, to doing um, reports and not doing the most important work. Here are the 10 steps uh, that are a part of the discernment process that we recommend um, that can take uh, six to nine months to prepare and to move into this model. So if this is something that you're looking towards, then um, in the first quarter of next year, you want to start that discernment process so that you could be ready to move into it in, uh, by January 1 of 2022. Um, you don't want to start this process in August and get ready for an October charge conference. You just don't have enough time to do the discernment piece and do it well and uh, do a really good job of, of communicating. So um, it, it's, it's a process. If we go into it, uh, with a discerning attitude and one of, of completeness and thoroughness, you're going to have a much better chance of this being effective for your church than to go into it um, just because somebody thinks it's a, it's a great idea or one person it's their agenda to get it through. Take the time, go through the discernment, go through the equipping and have someone walk alongside you that um, knows this model well, that can help you create really good um, new habits in how to be simplified and accountable in the leadership. So I know you probably just feel like that you have been fed by a big old fire hose, um, but I wanted to offer enough to give you a taste of what it is, um, but certainly we weren't able to go too deep into anything, but I'll be certainly glad to take any questions to help um, clarify anything at this time, Bill. We have a few. So first of all, I want to bring everyone's attention to your website, kcatan.com. I know they can find more information about this, and I've been on it and a whole lot more. Um, the one thing I appreciate about Kay is she is always producing quality materials, and um, our, our denomination is blessed by that. Particularly, I, I, I appreciate it, the voice from a lay person. And I didn't say that at the beginning. It is wonderful to have the voice of a lay person um, giving us this type of information um, this evening. So we do have a few questions. Um, well, I'm just going to go in the order that they came in, and some of them jump back. So one person has, asked, has mentioned that they have a very small church. Mm -hmm. uh, their Sunday attendance is around 30. So if they had a board of nine, that would be a third of their worshiping congregation. Would you still recommend nine? Or is there a scale depending on the size of your church? So um, the, the one thing to think about is there are four administrative teams right now take a whole lot more people than nine. And again, this was written for a small church to begin with that are having these kind of, of, of issues. Um, nine is the absolute minimum that we can get by with and still be in compliance with the book of discipline so we gave you the leanest model um, possible for for a church so nine is minimum and absolutely it was created for small churches excellent so we have two questions around finances yep. um, what's the role of the church treasurer mm -hmm. with the uh, simplified accountable structure that's great question step. Great question. We recommend the treasurer not be on the leadership team. Think of them as a kind of a support role, almost like a staff member. So they will certainly be providing those reports in the electronic packet that goes out to the leadership team before they meet. Um, but we suggest them not being on the leadership team um, itself, um, which means that we need to have a team of people who know how to read the reports. However, if there's something kind of different or unusual about that particular month's reports. Um, and they can always put a note in with uh, the report for any um, kind of clarification. Like for instance, uh, you'll notice our cash flow is low this month because we had to pay our annual um, insurance premium. I mean, they don't need to go to, to the meeting to do that. Keep in mind that all meetings are still open by book of discipline except for when we need to go into executive session for any HR related issues. Typically, um, if there are going to be HR issues discussed, 
that would be at the end of the agenda. So the rest of the meeting could still be open. So in that in that line of the financial reports, is that is that work done by the leadership board or is there a separate ministry team that does the financial reports that are just then delivered or sent to the leadership team? So whether it's the treasurer who are doing those financial reports or you have a business administration, um, whoever is actually putting those reports together would be putting those in the packet. Um, that's kind of done in different ways. Um, but typically it's done by a person um, that then puts it into the packet. Okay. And um, in one of your earlier slides, you had, you're listing the different types of structures that church uses. And the first one you mentioned the word it's, um, I believe this team is a, not effective, but safe. And somebody would like to know, what is your definition of safe? Ah, okay. So safe would be where we, we actually have um, the practices in place where there's accountability for someone's um, responsibility and authority that we have given them. So often we just let, oh, go do it. You know, we, we don't want to have to be responsible for it. So we give them all this authority and responsibility, but then we go, we don't say, we don't ask any questions. We don't check the books. We don't see if it's missionally aligned. Um, they're just kind of going rogue. And so that makes it not safe. Um, we, we often, um, almost write blank checks, if you will, metaphorically to, to folks um, because it's easier. But then that's where we have pet ministries that occur that we can't ever stop uh, because we've let someone just kind of say, this is my baby and I'm doing it under the name of the church and I get whatever budget I want. And it may not ever align missionally. It, it's never made a disciple, um, but yet we continue to have it continue because we're not willing to hold them accountable. That's when I'm talking about not safe, an example of. Okay. Um, now, you also, you mentioned there different structures have different consequences. Mm. What are, flesh that out a little bit. What are some examples when you talk about consequences? So um, like one of the consequences of a pastor-centered church is um, we may see tremendous growth during, during that time, um, especially if they um, are a personality, big personality kind of thing. But when the, um, the folks they're bringing in are not connected to other laity, they're not connecting um, to other people and ministries, when that pastor leaves, you'll see a drop in attendance because it was centered on the pastor rather than it being um, a shared lay and pastor um, driven church, which is missionally um, focused. Um, the autocratic is one person's leading and making all the decisions. If we lose that person, lay or clergy, then we all have been um, kind of disengaged. It's kind of like the motor's no longer running. And so we don't know how to function as a church because there was one person that was actually doing all the functioning for us. Okay. Um, some nitty gritty now, some people, I, I know the answer, but I, I think to hear from you, who then manages the financial and real property aspects of the church? Okay, so the four that the combined leadership team have the responsibility for finance, SPR, um, trustees, and the council. Okay, so ultimately that is the governing body. Um, what we often do at the leadership team is we get too far down into every entry in the checkbook. And that is not the role of governance. Um, they're looking at department or ministry kind of uh, broader categories instead of every expenditure. We put guiding principles into place for the other kind of, of pieces. So you don't have a separate finance team or you don't have a separate SPRC team. All these nine people are doing the broad work of all of those four entities. So that and was the finance. Was what was the other piece, Bill? Building aspect. So, I mean, I think, I think you answered that. So they would be the Building. ones who are responsible for setting the budget, for making sure that XYZ is done by somebody. They're the ones who are going to be evaluating the pastor yearly. Yep. The kinds of high, I would say the high level right. work that are done by each of the different 
committees. Now, we do have one person who has said, you know, it looks like you're putting a lot of responsibility on the pastor, fundraising, goal setting. Why should that not be the responsibility of the chairperson of the leadership team? So um, the goals are um, set by the leadership team with the, with the pastor there as well. Um, so it's, it's not like the pastor is, is having to, you know, set those alone. It's done with what are the, what are the things we need to do in the upcoming year so that the mission and vision um, become a reality. That becomes our goals for the year. So then the pastor takes the goals and kind of dissects them, if you will, with staff and divvies up the pieces to staff paid and unpaid ministry leaders to actually do the day-to-day -day ministry kind of, of pieces. So um, actually it gives the, the pastor um, more day-to-day -day flexibility and authority that they don't have to keep going back to the leadership team um, to ask for. It allows the pastor to do the higher level kind of leading pieces um, instead of being in a bunch of meetings. Um, and you have to hold, you know, a person accountable. You can't hold a team accountable. So the pastor is accountable to the board for the goals. But in turn, the pastor is holding team leaders accountable for the objectives that are set to help those goals get accomplished. So it's kind of this roll up factor from, you know, from objectives that roll into goals, that roll into mission, that roll into to vision. You, you've led me right in my next question. You're a good setup. You, you use the word accountable a lot. I do. How are individual board members held accountable? The, the, the question asker says, in business, there are bonuses, demotions, even being fired. So what are the accountable consequences for board members under this particular model? Yeah, and um, it could be board members or, you know, anybody up and down the whole, you know, somebody could be, quote, fired. Um, at, they, they have uh, been help to find another place to serve in the church is how we would use that, right? Um, but it could be a, a team member too. But specifically, the question was around um, board members. So when the board comes together, they do what we call a leadership covenant. They decide how they are going to do their work together. And that is where they'll hold one another accountable for their work. So in other words, um, and this is where a coach is helpful to kind of help set those first um, leadership covenants. There's an example of it in Mission Possible to say, okay, um, we will, um, and, and it's helpful to set up some of these expectations with nominations so that when you ask a leader to serve by being a nominations person, that they know what they're saying yes to from the beginning. So for instance, let's say, you know, we, we know life happens, but we need someone highly committed. So if you miss more than X number of meetings, then we hold one another accountable to have the conversation. Maybe this isn't the season for you to serve if you're unable to attend. Or let's say the leadership covenant says, we're gonna turn off our cell phones, but you've got someone who is constantly, you know, stepping out to take a call that isn't an emergency necessarily, or they're constantly on their phone then it's up to the leaders that have covenanted one to, with one another to say, hey, you know, remember, this is, this is not how we agreed um, to uh, work, do our work uh, together. Or um, another common one, especially in the beginning, is to say, now, um, Bill, I know you have the best of intentions, but you keep drawing us back into management conversations. So let's bring it back in. We're out in the tall grass. Let's bring it back in and, and let's stay within our kind of uh, work scope and that is, is governance. So their work is to hold one another accountable. And so under this model also, I guess with part of the accountability, do we follow the disciplines, um, the book of disciplines three year rotation cycle with this board as well? Yep, there so, are three classes. So, so the nine board members are each in three classes. So every year, three people rotate off, three people rotate on which also handles some of the accountability, I would say. You bet. So no one sits in the same chair for 20 years. Excellent. Now, speaking of sitting people in the chairs, you know, right now we may have a lot of committees, but we have committees that for people who love HR work, oh, we can serve here. And I love finance. You can serve here. I only want to do building stuff. Okay, you can serve here. So how do you find people 
who like all of it. Yeah. So this, this is probably not a very popular answer, but I'm pretty passionate about this. We have too long looked for leaders with the specialty area more so than we have recruited people because they are our most mature disciples, our most devoted Christians. We can go out, even if we have to go outside the church and find an HR specialist or a banker or a builder or a plumber. We love those people. We need those people. We hope they're in our congregation. And we hope that we have done our job as the church to help them grow as a disciple. But if we have to choose between the two, we need our most mature and devoted disciples leading our churches. And I don't know about you, Bill, but I've been in churches where we have people who don't even attend worship or um, they don't uh, ever give a dime. Um, they're, they're not doing um, anything except for maybe one pet ministry. They're, they're not fully living out being a, a fully devoted follower of Christ, but they're sitting in a leadership team because they have that specialty that we think that we need because that's the way we've been taught. And I'd like to challenge us to think we need our mature disciples leading our churches and we'll go out and consult with the other when we need it. But let's get our mature disciples at the table. Um, and so um, that changes what we're looking for and it changes. I don't need to have everybody like numbers and um, building and HR stuff. I just need somebody that is in love with the Lord. And I would, I would take it. I've, I've had churches where, oh, this person's a banker. Let's put them on finance committee. And they hate it because that's what they do every day, all day. And yep. they've been, they're more successful leading a small group. Yep. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So in, in our structure, we have certified lay ministers, as you know, yep. in, in the United yep. Methodist Church. Where do they fit into this? So if they are, sir, if they're appointed as the pastor, right, then they would serve in that pastor's role. Most often they're not full time, so you would have to scale back the expectations of that pastoral role um, in simplified accountable structure. And if they are serving in a ministry, then they would just be on a ministry team, not necessarily on the board. Or maybe a, a, they were leading a, as a staff member. Okay. So they're, you know, they're they're a paid staff member or they're an unpaid staff member leading a ministry. I do like how you, you put that in there, unpaid staff person. I do want to give a shout out. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Smothers. I know you had some local church responsibilities. I'm glad you could uh, join us tonight. I'm, I'm going to prepare you because you will be closing us in prayer tonight in, in a moment. I have one final question. You talked about, um, you mentioned that the laity should be the shepherd and not the pastor. So how do you define the word shepherd in this respect? In this respect, what um, we're referring to is so many times we expect the church to have pastoral care, and I uh, like to talk about it more like congregational care. So the, um, I'll call it the standard, not the, not the critical kind of care, um, would be done for one another. So in, in other words, the congregation has a congregational care system. So where um, we're visiting the shut-ins, we're, we're taking care of, um, you know, if they're in the hospital for, you know, two weeks, the, the pastor may have been there for surgery and checking in, but they're not expected to do all the care for that two weeks. The congregational care piece comes into play. We cannot have a pastor who is leading a, an effective church that's, that's growing and reaching new people and expecting them to be um, there for every cut and every hangnail. Um, that is part of a congregational um, responsibility, how we shepherd, how we take care of one another. Thank you. A uh, number of people asked about um, the coaching, and I know they can find out about that at kcotan.com. We'll put that plug in. I, I'm not going to put Dr. Smothers on the spot, but I think maybe he and I will have a conversation because I know there are some um, simplified accountable structure coaches and training available for that. So he and I will have a conversation about that offline because several people have asked about that for our annual conference. And that will be a, a conversation for another day, not tonight, but if people need to find out immediately, they can find that out about on your website, correct? 
Yep. And you also have um, some neighboring conferences that have um, some teams that are being uh, equipped for uh, coaching a simplified accountable structure that you might be able to um, help with too. <laughs> Wonderful. I know you'll get me a list of who that is as well. For those who were wondering, we have recorded tonight's session. It will be available on the conference website later this week. And when we post the um, recording, we will also post a copy of uh, Kay's slide deck so that you can go back and, and relook at uh, her wonderful notes. And my gracious, you are a, I thought you wrote a lot of books, Dr. Smothers. <laughs> um, but Kay doesn't sleep. Kay doesn't sleep because, I mean, I've seen all of these books. I've just never seen it all on one slide before, Kay. And that is um, amazing. I've, I've read a number of these. And so I highly recommend um, people taking the opportunity to, to check these books out. And the voice that you bring as the layperson who has such um, experience and giftedness is a great voice for us to be listening to at such a time as this. And Bill, before we close out, I also yeah. wanna say, um, Kay has worked with several churches in this annual conference. Um, and she has been uh, one of our preferred recommended coaches and, as, and has been especially effective in churches that really, 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 really need a deep dive into how to navigate through um, tough, and uh, I'm trying to find a, a nice word, Kay. Challenging. Challenging. <laughs> um, and I tell you, I've talked to some pastors and they've explained the situation to me and, and I've had to Fine, let me see, let me find Kay's number here. And I wanna thank you for that. So she's no stranger to, to the Baltimore Washington Conference. I want you all, you guys to know because um, while she's doing a phenomenal job in this present context, she's no stranger to our culture, to our churches and to our environments. And she knows her stuff. She's extraordinarily effective, and there have been some places that I didn't know that we were going to be able to save, but God used you in a powerful way, and I want to thank you for that publicly. Thank you. And, and uh, just continue to support the work that you're doing. You. Um, you've you've uh, let God use you in some extraordinary ways, and we're thankful for that. So one of the things I like to do as we close, since people cannot clap for you. I've opened up the chat, everybody, that you're able to send a thank you message uh, to Kay. She will be able to see all of them. So take a moment um, to um, drop a thank you to Kay in the chat, and she will see those. You should be able to uh, do that. As, as you're finding your way to the chat, um, I'll put in a little plug for next week's Training Tuesday as we continue on, let's see, today was season two, episode two. So next week is season two, episode three. Um, we are going to be welcoming Pastor Janice Harmon from the Emory Fellowship United Methodist Church in Washington, D.C., who is going to be walking us through how to use spiritual gifts to strengthen your nominations committee and your nominations process um, as you're looking for people who can serve on your simplified accountable structure on your leadership team, you want to use a spiritual gift, um, you can sign up for next week's Training Tuesday on the conference website. Uh, just look for the Training Tuesday in the drop-down menu. Um, so as those uh, thank yous are still coming in, if you could close us with a word of prayer, please, Dr. Smothers. All righty. Loving and gracious God, we give thanks for gifts of men and women, gifts that are shaped and developed and anchored in your love of us as spiritual leaders. We have been so blessed tonight to have feasted at this table with such rich and significant and relevant practical day-to-day -day resources that Kay brings to us in settings like this. 
we are grateful that she unselfishly gives of her time, her talents, her gifts, her service, and her witness in ways that really do make a difference. And uh, it's generational. You've gifted her not only in a present setting, but her teaching ability, her coaching ability, her her ability to shape leaders in deep well thinking is bearing fruit in so many places. And for that, we are glad. We are grateful that she thought it not Robert to take time out of her very busy schedule to come and be a part of this training tonight. And we pray in advance that you will continue to give an increase to her influence as she equips coaches, equips local churches, equips both lay and clergy in this important work of sharing these tools for ministry that makes a difference. For those who are our audience tonight, we're grateful for them. We know that you are serving in tough times and tough places and needing tough solutions to tough problems. And we just pray that God will stir in all of us solutions that will make a real difference as we seek to be led of the Holy Spirit to be effective in the places that you have sent us. So, Bill, we thank you for being an awesome facilitator of this season of learning. We pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you so much, Rodney. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Kay, for joining us. And for everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you. We will see you next Tuesday as we look at spiritual gifts and nominations. Have a wonderful evening and good night. Thanks for having me.